Yep. Okay, so it is the third episode of Track Coach Clubhouse. Um, I'm Andy Poppleton, Sprints and Hurdles coach from Tunbridge AC, um, joined by fellow coaches from Tunbridge. We've got Mark Cookway um, on the distance side and uh, Lewis Church on the multi event side. In this third episode, I was hoping we could talk through some of the issues around managing squad dynamics and building the right culture within a group. Uh, it's not the sort of thing that really gets covered on courses or in conferences and things like that a great deal. But I think it plays a pretty massive part in um, an athlete's experience and also sort of our experience as coaches as well. Um, so I think we kind of bring three quite different perspectives to the table on this. Um, I've spent the last few years starting a, a group from the ground up. Um, Lewis, you've inherited a sort of a, an established group, but then there's been like a really big culture shift in that going from having Dave coaching you to yeah. um, you being the, the, the athlete coach in that. So obviously that's quite a big change. Um, and then we've got Mark who, now Mark, I think you probably sometimes a bit too modest for your own good. Um, in the, if you look back to when you sort of started out on the endurance side with a bunch of under 13 lads, and I think it's, um, I hope I'm not doing a disservice to anybody else to say that there probably wasn't a huge amount going on at high performance level in the club on the endurance side when you sort of started. Um, so now being in a position where you've won the senior men's national cross three out of the last four years, I think there's a pretty strong claim to say you know, it's certainly one of, if not the best distance clubs in the country. And looking at it as well, you've got a great team spirit with a the group there, um, a great togetherness. And I was hoping if maybe you could kick us off by talking through um, how, that, how that's <coughs> developed, how the culture's changed um, over time, um, just as the co group has grown in number, but then also matured as they've got older. Yeah, yeah. I think um, when, when two of us started, first, we, we, there was two coaches and we had a group of like half a dozen something like that of 11-year-old uh, lads, basically. Um, that was in the really, really early days in about 2002. And um, we, we were very lucky because the two of us had known each other since the mid-70s. You know, Pete Mason, you know, one of my best friends. We get on well. We're, we're chalk and cheese in a way. You know, I, I've joked over the years that I'm a bit ca like Captain Mannering and he's a bit like Sergeant Wilson from Dad's Army. Um, which is which is nice because we get on really well, but you know we're quite open with each other um, and what we talk about and how we plan things. And he's always a good person to bounce ideas off. It. Invariably, he sees something in a completely different way. But somehow we just sort of got this little group together, and yeah, you know, clearly we because we've belonged to the club for like what forty five years each. Um, we are club people, and I think that's that's one thing that perhaps we took for granted because it, when you've got a training group, you've got, as I see it, and I was talking to some people last week about it, you've got the, the, the pools from the club perspective. You've got what you want to achieve as a group, as a group, as training group perspective, or you've got what individuals want to achieve. And so you've got three things that don't necessarily marry with each other all the time, uh, both organisationally, targets, ambitions and everything else. Um, but I suppose because we were club people and we had our group to develop from nothing, you know, the first two took care of themselves in a way. Um, but I only really appreciate that now when you see the difficulties that we've had and others had along the way. Um, but th one thing we sort of defined really early on was it seemed to be that it was about having a competitive team and performing at whatever age we had, uh, age group we were dealing with. You know, we weren't dealing with people who just want to come along and get fit and do other sports. We weren't dealing with people who you're just going to come along on club nights for, um, for um, like child minding or anything like that. It was very much, we're going to train, we're going to train properly, um, appropriate for the age group, and we're going to target some championships and we're going to, wherever we're going to finish, we're going to go to the national cross country championships or the southern championships or the county championships and do what we can and then try and improve on that each year. Um, so yeah, they, they were some things that we sort of agreed between us just because we, it wasn't a strategy. It was just, it just appealed really of a way of going about it. And some of those lads were 
friends from school as well so that that helped so it was just a an extension of their friendship really to travel to various events and build that build that perspective and did did you find you kind of got a um a lot of buy-in from the athletes to do that quite quickly did they kind of did that rub off on on them from from you or did you have a few sort of battles along the way to to get them there i can't recall a time andy where it hasn't been accepted in the group that we will go to championships as a, as a squad and you yeah along the way you, of course we've had people that have chosen to do other events but it's commonly accepted you know that certainly across the winter because the winter's an easier thing to manage everybody who does cross country is going to do you know the major championships pretty much yeah. from the club in the summer of course it gets a lot a, a lot more disjointed because people who have got the leagues and they've got um, open meetings and british milers club meetings and things like that but yeah, you know, we still try to funnel people into the league system, especially young athletes' league system, worked in a similar way, particularly in those those early days. Definitely, you know, starting with the Kent Young Athletes League, which were under 13s, under 15s, then the um, National Young Athletes League uh, with under 17s included, and uh, there's been a fair push that the, the club and the team perspective is quite important. Um, and that, you know, people rightly point the finger and say, well, that's all very well, but it's an individual sport or whatever. But I think if you want to build a squad dynamic or a team dynamic, mm. you know, you, you've got to look at outside the individuals a little bit as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. And people can that's achieve things individually within that. Within that. Absolutely. Now, um, Lewis, now, I think you're your ever present name on team sheets makes me think that you probably in, as an individual are really, uh, <laughs> buy into that sort of philosophy as, as, as well. Um, yeah. Do you find as, as a, is that a group wide thing or is that more of just uh, it varies from individual to individual within your group? What the, what wanting to be part of a club, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That kind of that, that, that group mentality rather than just looking at it as, as an individual pursuit. I, yeah. I like looking at it as a, it's like a, a club, like a working together thing, but obviously everyone's got their own agendas. Uh, so some people are less willing to put themselves forward for events than others. But I'd say in our group, we put ourselves out there quite a bit. We enjoy the enjoy the competing, enjoy the the club work. And in effect, really, it helps us improve individually anyway if we're in better leagues. Mm. So um, it's a give, give and take thing really but um i imagine we're mainly multi-eventers so we kind of just do everything anyway otherwise we get bored so uh <laughs> that helps out a bit uh for sprinters like your group i imagine some are much more reluctant to chip in and rightly so yeah i, I think with mine the um quite similarly i've always been very upfront with my pitch from the start that i expect them to compete um that's that, that's what they're there for i mean i've um, my two sort of ground rules that I sort of set down at the start are if if you want to be in the group, you bare minimum you turn up twice a week. If you're not turning up twice a week, then I'm not the right coach for you. It's it's just not going to work. You're going to have to you know, look to somebody else. Um, which I'm sure some people I've, I've had reactions that that sounds harsh in the past, and I've, I've been criticised about by some some of the athletes and, and their parents. In fact, when I've, I've I've turned people away, but my view is well, that's taking up a spot that I could be giving to somebody that is going to. Um, is going to do that um, and then the other side is that you know that's, they they are expected to compete um, now I'd, I'd never put somebody into a competition that is going to be that's out of, out of their level and it's going to be demoralizing um, but it's it, it, when there is a, an appropriate competition opportunity then I expect them to make themselves available for it um, and I think there's probably yeah there, there are instances when I, I certainly wouldn't want each athlete doing every single race. Um, I think it's it's just that is a sort of a recipe for overtraining, uh, well, overtraining, but um, overdoing it generally. Um, but we we do sort of try and put a, f a fair focus on the leagues. Um, I'll actually I, I will kind of talk to them at the start of the season. It's it's never sort of a formal sit down. Let, let's have a conversation about you know who, who's doing what. But um, we'll just sort of you know chat around it about 
which which ones of them are going to focus on which leagues. Um, and we generally always have cover. Um, I think it's it's got easier as um, as the group's grown, and then obviously you know Ian's um, group is, is is providing athletes as well. So I think we're in in quite a lucky position now, where um, a yeah. few years back you if say your, your top four weren't available, then you were really in difficulty. Whereas now, if your top four aren't available, then yeah, it would have been nice to have had them. But we're still turning out a guy that's going to you know, run low 11 and you know be kind of you know, high 22, something like that, mm-hmm. um, which is a, a, much, a much better position to fall back on. So. Yeah. Much more difficult for you, for you guys, though, because... Um, with distance running, you've got you've got eight hundred, fifteen hundred, a longer distance generally, a steeplechase, four by four, you can all get and you, you can you can use them in different ways, can't you, at different times. Uh, whereas with sprints, and you can use it tactically or whatever you want to do. Um, whereas with sprints, hundred meters flat out, that's you know <laughs> yeah. you, you can't do yeah. <laughs> you can't go about it tactically or anything else uh, you can perhaps put in their head that it's not quite so important but nobody's going to go into 100 meters and not try and get their start spot on fa- different phases dead right and try and do well um, so uh, absolutely I mean yeah you're right I mean there might be times when you're kind of talking about um, with with the low key ones that you know perhaps you're using as as a as a train as a training race um, and you know you, you may be getting them to think about something a bit more than you know when it's kind of competition you just kind of okay. just put them on the line and let them go a, a, a serious one is just you know, put them on the line and let them go so you don't really want them to think about it too much an, an early season open then it might be you're actually trying to transfer across some of the things that you're doing in training and it, it's kind of bridging the gap a bit but um but yeah it, it's it's certainly not a case of I can't. <laughs> You know, if, if you've got in an 800 and say, right, okay, I, I want you to, I want you to sit on the shoulder. Don't whatever pace it is, don't take the lead. I want you to just kick on this. Um, or you have one way, you know, say, look, I want you to go through in, you know, 58, come hell or high water. You are running 58 with the bell. <laughs> you, you can't do that. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. Um, so Lewis, how have things changed in your experience going from that? You know, it's, it's, it's what three, we talked about the other week. I think three years in now, isn't it? Um, going from having Dave leading it, who obviously Dave, a very seasoned, very successful coach, um, a long established group to yeah. it's like I say, it, on the one hand, you kind of inherited the group. So there's some continuity there in terms of the same faces, but um, I imagine the dynamic must be very different having you who were one of the athletes there, you know, you know yeah. alongside everybody to now you, you've kind of got that dual status. Yeah. So, um, Obviously, the dynamics of the group has changed massively. I've been in it for 10 years now. So I joined it when I was 13. When I joined, I was a lot younger than anyone else in the group. And there was lots of like 16, 17-year-old boys and girls. So the dynamic has changed every single year. So effectively, every year, obviously, the main bulk of people then go to university and then come back. So, Or some come back, some don't. But so I can't really speak for the start of when I joined, but from the crossover period, I didn't really inherit a big group because obviously Dave left when I think probably six or seven people were at the age where they go to uni. So it was pretty weird being obviously the athlete, then the one setting the sessions and the one that you have to not, uh, not buy to, but someone that you then got to ask for an opinion instead of just having a little chat with. Yeah. bit of a laugh so that's a bit strange but again like I said it wasn't loads of the same faces so I think when I actually took over the group um, there was only two or three people that were still in the group that I was training with a lot regularly anyway yeah it's quite um yeah it's just so the dynamic changes every single year basically and it used to be a 400 meter hurdles group predominantly and as I got older in the group it started becoming more of a multi-events group was more people then join in so you got harry kendall joined in the group uh started doing multi-events and then alex took away joined in the group two or three years ago so the dynamics changed gone completely for like almost full circle and it's quite a focused group now whereas there was 
a big mix before and it's gone through stages of uh, the group being a bit more of a social and then opposite way everyone's mm. massively focused on high performance but I guess that goes down to how many people are in it for what reason so now I'd say the majority of us that are doing athletics in the group are highly focused on getting as good as we can be yeah but um yeah it's difficult for me to talk about the dynamic of being an athlete to a coach because it's almost the same because I've been doing a lot of my own stuff anyway. I'm just now carrying it over onto the track. So I've always been one of those people where, one second, always been one of those people where people would ask a bit of advice of what should I do in the gym? So it didn't really feel much different to me. Yeah. But it's just a yeah. bit, it's still, it's still a bit strange. So I'm like, obviously, Harry and Alex in the group, we both compete against each other and we're friends already. For them to take advice off me for training or have to put their faith in me to set the right sessions. <laughs> so, not, sabotage, not sabotaging them. Come, come, come no, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Difficult, I think. So I, yeah. I struggle with it being the other way around. How do you mm. see the, um, how do you see it developing? How do you define the group? What are you trying to achieve as a group? Uh, we're, we're going for, well, peak performance basically. But um, I always wanted to be a bit of a club element as well. So I don't, if everyone becomes too individualized, it ends up becoming uh, not, I'm trying to think of a good word for it, not like salty, but like people then just go, oh, I'm not doing this. And there's then friction if not everyone's on the same page. Mm. So um, generally, if, so if I was talking to someone that would come into the group, like uh, Andy said, I'd be expecting people to compete and do a bit for the club as well as obviously improving themselves individually because that's give and take uh, with that but the, the, what we're trying to achieve is just everyone taking it really seriously really yeah yeah, yeah. Like I, I said it's I, difficult because it's such a small group like yeah. one person can change the dynamic massively yes yeah yeah and um, have you have you Certainly, please don't name name any names. We don't want to get any, anyone in any trouble. <laughs> Have you had any issues like that along the line yet? Uh, yeah, I've definitely had one or two. But again, where well, if you've got quite a few very strong characters in the group, there's obviously not many of us. Only about five or six. If you're not in line with that, you must. Yeah. I wouldn't say you get bullied out, but you just know you're not really fitting into it. Yeah. So you're being no, encouraged I... non-stop to kind of get into this into the swing of it and if you don't then you just you, you quickly find yourself not being left out but quickly find yourself not having the same views or not having the same drive yeah um, yeah can't can't no, name any names in particular. no no it's interesting i i very when i first started not um at tunbridge but at my um the first group that i i, I coached back in worcester um a very similar experience where i, I didn't realize at the time just how lucky i was in that I got to be, I, I got to get away with being the fun one all the time because the one of the first two athletes I had, she was, um, she was at the time she was probably more, more mature than I was back then. Um, she was only sort of 14, 15, right now. but um, and she was very serious, very focused, um, and basically just didn't take any messing from anyone. So she was the disciplinarian. So I, yeah. I, I, got, I got to be the nice guy all the time. I never really had to call anyone to account. So I knew that she would, <laughs> which was, it, it made life so much easier. And I think if you can have a character like that in the group, um, I mean, that's, that's just brilliant. Um, I think it's, I think they're, they're fairly rare individuals. I think it's, um, I mean, we sort of come on to sort of like personality types and things you get in groups, but I think there's that you get different types of leaders. You get those that just sort of quietly get on with it themselves and just sort of lead by example um um you know there's absolutely nothing wrong with that that's, that's that's great but just from a coach's angle i think if you can have somebody that is um is like your sergeant really that can just be so valuable in that it's that they're not a, they're not an assistant coach in the sense of like kind of actually providing input but just in terms of keeping things on the straight and narrow and yeah, keeping everything running in a session it, they've got huge. a shared goal haven't they they know exactly what what you want them to do and they know what they want to do 
with yeah we had a few like you say a few people like that in our group when i started one of the one of the guys in the group called craig very focused but he wouldn't really talk much so you think oh he's really taking it seriously and then you get other the other side of it where people are going oh should we take this rep a little bit slow and if you get a few of those in the group yeah it, then suddenly suddenly you've got a group of runners running together slowly yeah and not putting full effort in so it's definitely good to have a like you said disciplinarian in there um and keeping you really strict on the rest uh making sure you're pushing hard because well we've got a thing in our group now imagine it's not so much in yours and this is always run quite individually and it's all sprinting anyway but imagine it's a lot in marks as well the last rep athlete <laughs> who, just wants, who just yeah. just chills all <laughs> session and then bombs it so we don't we we get a lot of abuse now a lot of grief if you're doing that in our <laughs> session like well no push every rep yeah so we don't have to see you just go off in the distance and use us for 12 reps <laughs> yeah no i um yeah you, you're right tend not I, the way that my training tends to go I tend not to have too many of those but um i the way that i trained myself um, back when i was an athlete yeah there's, there's a lot of volume in those and we there were plenty of over the years there were a few last rep larry's in there and um it was a well known but i think when i do have things like that though i kind of one of my things i always sort of say to mine is um that anyone can run the last rep um, so this is when I get to the penultimate one. That's when I sort of, and they're, they're, you know, let's face it, by the time you get to the penultimate rep of like kind of a, a relatively high volume session, you, you, you're going to be hurting a fair bit. Um, that's Could when I, yeah, yeah that, that's, that's when I'm on their case about, okay, this, this is the one I want you to push. Because I, I, I know you're going to do the last one. The last one, anyone can finish that. Anyone can pull something out of the last one. But show me what you can do on the penultimate one. Um, but um, unfortunately, I think at the moment that is, mainly coming from me um i think it would uh yeah i tend not to have that side of it so much in, in the group at the moment um but and i think one of the things i find talking about the kind of uh the, the difference in the groups like i said i had that um disciplinarian in the the first group i had and it was a real shock to the system when i came to tumbridge and started here in that whilst i had some you know some really good and dedicated athletes because they were all a, a bit quieter in their manner of, of doing it and they kind of just kind of got on with things themselves like i say sort of a leading by example rather than um rather than cracking the whip themselves they um when when somebody needed to be a disciplinary it had to be me which i was really uncomfortable with because i'd had about eight years of not needing to <laughs> and it was because i think even after that um that girl had, had left and gone to university um the tone had been set um so it's got everybody that had come into the group sort of under her under her reign she, she was very much the kind of queen of the group <laughs> wasn't necessarily the best athlete but just that, that that sort of personality um everyone that had come in during that time that had set the tone and they they kept it going and that was one of my sort of big learning experiences starting at tunbridge was Okay, I've, I've, on the one hand, it's a blank canvas, and I can kind of create what I want in, in terms of that. But on the other hand, I had to do it all myself, which was um, so some bits have, have worked well. Like I say, I think that that understanding that you you compete and all those sort of things that we were talking about earlier, and, and that that commitment to training, that's come across. But it's um, it's been a bit. I've, I've managed to do it, but it's been a bit of a battle along the way, um, and. I, I don't want to use the word weeding out because that's it, it's not been kind of like you know, a case of targeting people and saying I don't want you there. It's it has been a bit like you were sort of saying, Lewis. Once you manage to get that um, that culture established, yeah. then those that don't buy into it, they they just gradually drift away. Um, I can I can only think of a couple of instances where I've sort of had to um, suggest to people that you know it's time for them to look elsewhere. And that those have been, um, those have, have been fairly exceptional. Most of the, most of the times, it has been just a case that um, that, that they realise it's not really for them. Yeah, yeah. So, how about you, Mark? I think you must have had a few 
no, few right. experiences over the years with um, well, on, 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 on both sides of that. You're going to, what about those individuals you've had over the years that have, have really added something to the group? What, what have they done and how? And similarly, those where you've had a bit of a challenge with them, how, how have you managed that? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think there's, when you listen to you two talk, there's, there's a huge difference between my situation and your situation. You, you've got um, quite a divergence in, in abilities. Um, you're also, because they're technical events, you've got to keep, you know, a lot of the time, even the sprinting is much more technical. So you've got to keep a really close eye on people. They've got more time to think, which is, isn't necessarily a good thing with mm. discipline in between efforts. Um, you know, I was watching your group, I think, uh, the weekend, Saturday morning. Got quite a big, you know, two groups of six down there sort of working together. You've got, you got the assistant coach looking after some. And I'm watching it and thinking, it's quite difficult. I watched a few doing starts with the wind behind them and going through the phases. And really, really you, you've got to be so on it with them to get, because as somebody once said, yeah, it's like hurdling. It's very difficult to do hurdling at 50% effort because it's when mm. you do it 100%, I think it was you told me, when you're doing it 100% effort, the technique is completely different. So you've got to be, 100% focused and make, maximizing their effort in a short period of time. And then they have this break where they, they've got this cut, you know, they're coming down off it. Yeah. And you've got almost, I, I imagine you've almost got to read them and what's going through their head and what their mood is and everything else. With our group, you know, we, we'll, we'll have, say, 30 turn up. I check them all off. I'm, they, Should clarify, not at the moment during social distancing. No, in normal, in normal <laughs> situations. Yeah, normal situations. We have 30, we, we break them down into three or four groups, all closely matched, so they're going to feed off each other. Um, and I pretty much know who's, who's, who's got their strong points, depending on whether they're doing 400s or mile reps or whatever. So you, I know them well enough to split them up into the subgroups. I know the characters in terms of who's going to push along reps, who might go too fast too early pretty much we because they're all over 18 and got quite a lot of experience now they will say what do you think i ought to be aiming at for you know to start with etc and we'll have a dialogue every single person every single group um and then i might have to you know chip in and say come on uh lewis i want you to lead this one set the pace or whatever and it's accepted um and then I've got individuals who I would know will take responsibility within that. You know, um, there's some really good people. Where, where I have to really watch out for is those that fall between groups one and two or groups two and three. They're either at the back of one group or at the front of the other and psychologically uh, play a few games with them and, and move them around depending on the session. Um, but generally, we haven't got the long, longer recovery periods. Uh, mm. The paces are, it can be set so they know what they're going to aim for. And, you know, sometimes I'll just, you know, so we're doing 800 metre reps and you can sense it. You can look at them. You can see how they're running. You can see how chatty they are. And I will just give them a nudge after that. Say, oh, that's a bit slow, you know, and I, that's all I have to say. And then they pick it up and then the session's rolling. Um, and sometimes with certain track sessions, I will always throw in a couple of 200s at the start just to get them grouped up, settled, get them moving, get them into the session before we've wasted a couple of reps while they're doing that, you know. So yeah. See what I mean? So it's a, it's a lot different. And I think I believe the same with the younger ones as well back in the day. Um, yeah. As I say, I was a bit of a Captain Mannering, so uh, I'm quite a disciplinarian. Um, in all sorts of ways people know the rules uh, i won't mess about i won't um avoid a case i will take somebody to one side and have a word with them if they're dragging their feet or checking their yeah you know, just check they're okay to start with and things like that um yeah so and also in after the after the sessions i will go through take it all in message people and say oh that that was a bit slow today are you all right and things like that and um hopefully then it will resolve itself for the next the next one but um it's all about communication and body language sometimes they're mucking about as a group having a laugh and I, you know i have as laugh as much as many people but 
you know, I had to clap my hands and say, come on then, let's um, get some quick strides in. Let's get psyched up for this. This means a lot. I'm trying to put the session in context of what we're trying to <coughs> achieve. So, so, so I don't, don't really think we got or needed to have characters around to, for others to look up to quite so much, you know, because there's enough respected people within the overall group. They know they're not down there to muck about and play games. And I think that, um, that has, that runs right through the whole lot then. Um, so mm. that's not a problem. I mean, the, the leaders I use, there are certain ones that are well respected. Um, and they've got a very even handed approach on things. And sometimes I will say to somebody, yeah, I've heard, I've heard things going on in their life. Um, would you, would you just take them to one side and check them out, check they're okay or yeah. work with them? Um, yeah, I heard they were on the lash the other night. And can you, can you have a word as well as me? Cause mm. otherwise it's just like, you know, old Mark, it's old Mark banging on again. There are, there are people that you can really use in a larger group like that. Um, and they, they're more likely to take it on board. Um, it's much more difficult with a small group, of course, uh, I think to do that, to use other people quite so much so well. Yeah. Um, no, I think that, that's, that's a really good example. You talk about how getting the sort of more, um, getting the well-established and you know, respected ones to bring, you know, pull people up on points, like, like you were saying about kind of, you know, if, if, if they're going out and, and, and drinking. That reminds you of a list to a podcast um, uh, a little while ago, of a guy Alan Bishop. He's a um, strength and conditioning coach at one of the Texas colleges on on the basketball side. Um, but he's very very well respected S and C coach um, generally. And he he was talking about the kind of the, the challenge you have with sort of trying to enforce rules around those sort of lifestyle things. In that typically, particularly those athletes that are um, they're, they're bringing a lot of genetic gifts to the table. You know, they're, 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 they've, they've got a lot to start with. The, the reality is, they if, if if you tell them, look, if you if you you know have have a you know a burger a week, or if, if you're if you if you're going out and having a drink, then you're going to run terribly, and everything's going to fall apart, and you're like, well, the reality is that they're, they're they're good enough that they can usually get away with it a bit. So if you say that, they they know that's not true. If 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 you just try and come down hard and on, on like kind of those one instances they know that's not true but if they can have a, a someone they respect that's doing what they're trying to do at that place they're trying to get to and say look yeah you, you might be able to get away with it now but that's not sustainable that's not you know i yeah. think that means a lot i think it kind of that that carries a lot of weight yeah, yeah. definitely it's uh, and also uh, uh, yeah, if you go back to school days, yeah, you know, I used to hate the real disciplinarians, you know, that were always throwing chalkboard um, rubbers at you and stuff like that. Oh, I got shit. dragged by my hair once. Which is, I had long yeah, hair. I had, cool I, <laughs> things that would never happen today. Lewis yeah. never have experienced some of the stuff we would have had at school. But I used to hate it. Those that were even-handed, balanced, you knew they wanted the best from you, but you could engage with them with the ones you remember, you know, and... Um, I try and be like that with with, uh, with all the athletes, just because that's the way I feel comfortable with. But I, the, the worst thing, the worst thing for me is being taken for granted. Mm. So if we're going somewhere, somewhere, I've left when I've been team managing, you know, whether it's our group or somebody else from another group, I've left the told the bus to go and leave people behind before, um, and I don't have to do that many times. And everyone knows if it's my trip, they are going to be. You know, the time specified is when the bus is leaving, not when you turn up. You know, mm. you're not going to hold everybody else up. Or um, your um, your behaviour at a hotel, it, you, you are going to um, bear in mind there's other guests in the hotel. You're not going to hang around in corridors and have a chat because it echoes and will upset other guests. Um, you're not going to run around the corridors. Um, you're going to you're going to tidy up the bus and pick all your rubbish up before you get off it. It is not job the bus driver's job to go and sweep up and clear up the mess after you. Same with when when we're training, well you know on the fields or whatever. We're not going to leave drink bottles everywhere and stuff like that. You're going to pick it up, banana skins, all this sort of stuff. Others others I've seen let that go, but I won't I won't let that go. It's um 
it's about respecting other people and respecting themselves. Um, yeah. I, I think, Lewis, my perspective from the outside is, I think, given that you've got a bunch that are, I know you've got some veterans in there, but mostly you kind of be around similar, similar age um, yeah. and all get on really well. Do you, do you find you kind of, you, you don't have to worry about those issues just because it's, I, I imagine it's like kind of the, it's more like kind of they're the, the treating you perhaps the way the way wants to treat a friend because they wouldn't want to sort of screw a friend over that way by leaving them to deal with all that sort of mess and those sort of things. Yeah, but then again, if I'm, we obviously we have, we have little conflicts in the group, obviously we're quite good mates anyway, but yeah. you say it as a mate, you can say it quite, because we're all quite good friends in the group, you can say it very bluntly Yeah. and no one gets too offended. Yeah. So sort, sort it out, like you always leave rubbish around here chuck it away or if someone's just moaning before the reps you end up just telling them to shut up <laughs> that's it's it's a very it's very different because we're obviously grown up together most of us mm. and uh you're all very uh, like a tight-knit group whereas if you're in your situation they're obviously most of the teenagers they're going to treat you almost like a almost like a parent like, oh, he's shouting yeah. at me again. And then they're probably not <laughs> going to do it. Um, so, Lewis, the fact that you've got my son in there, who transferred from distance running to multi-events. Yeah. And he knows what I'm like. I mean, he grew up with our group. Um, yeah. So, I, met, I would like to think he's very supportive and he understands those disciplines. Um, and some of them would wind him up if people were... Oh, definitely. Yeah, you do. So Alex, be Alex, the same as me. Will call someone out on something if they're not doing it right, and yeah. say if one of us is in a bad mood for some reason, we'll, <laughs> we'll let you. We'll we'll let them know that we know they're in a bad mood, and they should be snapping mood. out of it because it's bringing the <laughs> bringing the group down. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, he used to get grumpy. I've been going through my. I can remember him. I know. I know. Performances and things like that. That's where it's, um, yeah, body language and things. You know, you could tell with one of ours last night. He'd had a bad day with work, really fed up, and he he wasn't happy. He got through it, and he was by the end of it, he was he was all right because he'd done a good training session. And you always feel better for doing a training session. Um, but he got down. I get. There. Yeah, it's yeah. important. You got. Yeah, you know, I spoke to him about it. He messaged me afterwards. Said he just had a bad day. Sorry, he was in a bad mood. But that's good. That's good because he's he's recognising it. But you can't. I don't think you can avoid it. You've got to pick people up on it, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. No, I think that that lack of um, ha having respect and having appreciation for um, your, the coach and your teammates. I think that is something that is it, really key to get that in a group. And I think it's something that. Um, in all honesty, early on when I started Tunbridge, I, I, I came in with like really great lofty hopes of what I wanted and that I was going to really kind of going to be like kind of the architect of this culture. And then um, it took me, I think, about two and a half months to get an athlete um, outside of. There was one that actually moved down from Midland the same time as me, so I was working with her. And then there was um, a, a couple of others that someone from outside the club got in touch and said, "Look, could you help help them out?" So that's, I mean, around that time I was doing, I was helping you out, Mark, with your steeplechases and things. Um, in large part, just to have, I had the time. Um, but it, I, in all honesty, I probably got a little bit, um, I got a bit lax with some of my rules, with the early ones, just because I wanted to have a group to work with. <laughs> and whilst I think, I, if I was in that situation again, I don't know, I, I'd, I'd like to think that I'd actually would be a bit more true to my values on that early on because I think it's take, it took quite a long time to unpick that um, but I, I, I think eventually we've got there but there have been some pretty outrageous instances of sort of lack of respect along the line I mean there's one of the, like I said there's very few that I've actually said I'm not coaching you anymore um, I, I can only think of two actually but you know one of them it was actually a case of I'd um, you'd had, you know there was always an excuse for why he wasn't there. And then, you know, for, for when he turns up, he's, oh, I've had, I've had these back issues. And I actually line, lined up um, an osteopath to come down at the weekend. Um, it was agreed that that was the time he was going to come down. The osteopath came down. It was completely free, but, you know, he was going to come down and see him. And he didn't show up. 
And I was like, okay, it's not only have you wasted my time, yeah. you've made me waste somebody else's time. Yeah. And at that point, I was just like, no, we're, we're not doing this anymore. You need to go and find somebody else because I'm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think that's probably the the most extreme example I've had. But yeah. I think if I if I'd been really strict from the start on what the expectations were, I probably wouldn't have had that. Um, and in all honesty, you know, he he was there from early on, and there were signs right from the start. And I, I probably shouldn't let it get that far down the line before. It's difficult, Andy, though, because um, you know, don't get me wrong. Uh, it's been a rocky old ride. I mean, I, I, I'm trying to write um, down an account, of, like a book. Well, it is a book of the, the progress over 15 years, and I've just got one chapter called Teenagers because we just had <laughs> we just had an horrendous year. Yeah, I think it was it was around 2012, funnily enough, and. It was a lot of it was over social media, yeah. And um, that to me was um, demonstrating what they're really like, you know. Behind, yeah, they can come to the club, they can behave themselves for a, an hour, they can yeah. do the right things, train hard, then they go away and they act, act like complete idiots. Despite, and it wasn't just once. It wasn't just once. One morning, I'd tell them one day, and the following day there'd be something else ridiculous written on Twitter or Facebook or something, you know, pretty disgusting stuff. Nothing to do with the club, just yeah. not how you represent yourself. No. One of the things is, you know, how many people, how many lads would you see with a bottle of lager at a party as their Facebook profile picture? No, you don't do that. And they, they look at me and go, what? why Mark? Why not? Because you're representing not only yourself, you're representing me most of, you, most of your friends are athletes. I look stupid because you're not, you know, you're clearly not taking it seriously. The club, you're representing the club. And in many cases, they're on the brink or are getting some sort of sponsorship, you know. And, yeah. Or they've got, you know, they're 17 or whatever and not far away from getting interviews and applying for things like American scholarships, etc. And, you know, it doesn't take it's not beyond the wit of man to look at your no. social media and see what's going on and I went through all this and in the end there was I, I won't tell you I can't remember off the top of my head exactly what it is but I I just wrote to the whole group said I'm not coming down I'm not coming down this week and and left them all to it um, yeah. I was so disgusted with it um, because I felt like I was pushing water up a hill um, it's, it settled down it's sorted itself out but it was a, it was quite a, quite a bad year where I don't think I ever lost respect. I just think they were so lazy in their thought processes at that age. Um, and clearly parents were probably unaware, to be fair, um, a lot of the time. Uh, and if they were aware, weren't able to do anything about it. But I can remember um, a UK athletics coach saying to me once, I don't do social media, Mark. Um, and I, I got quite shirty. I said to him, well, perhaps you should because then you really know what goes on. You're, you're out of touch if you're not. You've got to have some sort of feel for this sort of thing. Um, because it, you know, they, can, they can try and hide as much as they like from, from you, but you find out what's going on. And yeah. Uh, yeah, at the end of the day, they're coming off the track, fed up with performances and stuff. Um, and yet their behavior and the way they've been operating just a few days before isn't conducive to maximizing performance so you can't have it both ways can you no no absolutely so sounds quite but, hard but you know uh, I think no they, no and it, but it's it's like you're saying it's getting that as we said before it's having that agreed sort of goal and purpose for the group of, of, of what you're trying to achieve and which um no no like i thought you articulated really nicely lewis and the thing is it's I think sometimes people can hear things like that and almost kind of think it sounds elitist. And it's, it's, the thing is, it's not about elite performance. It's about kind of adopting elite habits. You know what I mean? It's like you, it, I, I'd much rather have somebody that's kind of working really hard, doing all the right things, committing to what they're doing and running 11.5 than having somebody that's asking around the whole time and running 10.8 yeah. in my group. Because it's that, yeah, so that, that's... Uh, I think there's a really good book by um, Brett Bartholomew called The Art of Coaching. But he, in, in that, he talks about different personality types. And um, one of them he calls soldiers. 
and they're basically they're like the, the workhorses of the group and they're just they 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 do things properly they follow you know follow the letter of law and they really just buy into it and, and just um and, and just persevere and it's sort of saying you know that they, the danger with them is they possibly kind of overwork themselves and, and try and take a, take on the burden a bit too much but th those sort of people are just a real joy to coach joy to coach it's, it's so much nicer when you're kind of just having to hold people back a little bit and say no you, you need you need to just take a rest and let your body recover and get to buy into the idea that rest rather than having to um rather than having to sort of drink g someone up to do something i remember one of the brilliant piece of advice one of the, um my sort of early coach mentors i guess a guy mike bennett at worcester um really really lovely guy but he, i remember him saying to me early on don't ever put more effort into the athlete than they're willing to put into themselves um yeah. and at the time i kind of thought cause, cause I, think this, I think he could see what i was doing it's because when it was when i was starting out and i was having the odd occasional athlete new, new one come along and I think they were kind of maybe trying out the sport. And I think he, he could see me getting, you know, several months down the line of kind of in my head, getting, you know, what, what I was wanting to do and where I was wanting to go with these athletes. And it's just, well, let's just see if they come back next week. Let's <laughs> just, 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 just bide your time and let's just see how committed they are mm. before you kind of get too invested in it. Um, so you're saying that, you know, it's, it, it's great that you've got that enthusiasm, but you're not going to last in the sport if you, Put your heart and soul into every athlete before you've even figured out whether they're really invested in what they're doing. Because um, it, it's it's just really I don't know how you how you find it, but I find it really really emotionally draining when you've got an athlete that you know has all that potential and isn't willing to kind of put the put the work in. Or it, it's you, you can go so, so so far in terms of trying to. To, to show them and get, and get to see what the, what they could be capable of, but at the end of the day, if they don't want to do it, it's it's not going to happen, and yeah. it's like I say, it's just so emotionally draining. Yeah, it is very very. Yeah, and the biggest fear is they're going to be forty years old and look back, and it'll be could have, should have, would have, or whatever, and um, you can see it happening. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. Um, I mean, some of, our, some of our best athletes get so frustrated with their colleagues, you know, when, they, when they're like that. Yeah. They, it's happened. It's happened a, a few, you know, quite a, quite a fair bit. As many, as many that go through and maximise their opportunity equals those that don't. You know, it's 50-50 um, it's probably. And, um, yeah, it, it's, it's sad to see, but then not everybody, you got, it's, the sport is made up of physical capability and mental capability, isn't yeah. it? So, yeah. Well, yeah. I think it's, again, it's something that Mike said, I was having a conversation about one of the athletes that he first sent to me um, to do some hurdles. It's like, that's how I started coaching. I think I mentioned it on the first episode. But um, she was like bags of natural ability. Um, but she's, essentially, I think she was kind of trying pretty much every power event on the way out of the sport actually realized that basically those that actually worked harder um tended to improve i think kind of that that uh she'd kind of gone slightly beyond that stage where just natural talent was enough um you know the, the people that were maybe not as gifted but you know, that committed to training they were overtaking her yeah. so i think she was sort of moving from one event to another and i remember chatting to him and saying oh, it's just such, such a shame such a shame and he said well you know don't beat yourself up over it because what we've done is Yes, she, she may have left the sport now at you know, 16 or whatever, but she's actually really enjoyed it. Mm. She's come away with a really positive experience of the sport. And, you know, they, those genes are still floating around there. It's you never know. Her kid in, yeah. you know, 15, 20 years time, yeah. you know, th those, those genes may be there. And because she's had that really positive experience, she's, you know, she's going to be, she won't think twice about sending down the athletics club. Yeah. Um, so kind of the, the what you sort of put into the athletics ecosystem as a way it's it's still a kind of a, a net gain even if that particular athlete hasn't then gone on and run whatever times um and i think he's a bit of a sort of a, a club coaching philosopher is old mike uh, we should get him on at some point but um <laughs> it's <laughs> but he um that that really kind of made me look at the situation differently um and yeah i, I think again it's just so important that the the environment we're creating is uh, for the athletes to train in is a good one mm. yeah definitely 
Um, for you two, it's not so much, again, with Mark, it's much more difficult. But if you've got one, one bad egg in your group now, do you think it would spoil others or do you reckon they'd just be weeded out? Who are you talking to? I, either of you, because like they could uh, change the I, dynamic completely. Under that description, I would say over the years, real, real bag eggs that are spreading, you know, just ruining the whole experience for people are very few and far between. Um, there have been one or two, uh, and it and ruined it for me as well. Um, it's it's very difficult because sometimes there are those that have other issues going on in their lives, and one of one of the things that goes through my head is that we could be their final resort, whatever in their life. Mm. I mean, I maybe I'm taking the responsibility <coughs> too far sometimes. But I've, I've, I wrote down in my notes, don't close doors on athletes. I mean, they mature at different times. They, their personalities change at different times. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm worried that if I, if I cut complete ties with these people, um, I have lots of chats with them over the years uh, and they come and go, some of them. But I've never closed the door because I have, I'm fearful that one day I'll get bad news that for whatever reason they're not here anymore and they didn't have anyone to talk to. And I just mm -hmm. want to make sure <laughs> that's the, you know, those are the sorts of characters we're talking about. I would say who got who are troubled sometimes, you know, why would anyone else want to disrupt a, a good environment? Um, they, they either haven't got any ambition in the first place or they've got just a strange character trait. I don't I'm having too many of those. I mean, we get, <laughs> there's, there's, there's some that we've had over the years that just too much energy, you know. But I mean, they're just like 13, 14 year old lads, and you know, they just need they're like little puppies, you know, they get too excited and go to the club. Which that's a bit different, isn't it? Than uh, when you got a more mature, you know, an older athlete. Um, oh, I think you, yeah, I think you, don't, you have to really talk to them and understand what they so they understand what they're doing to the club or the group um, very difficult without talking about specifics or understanding what, whether you're getting at anything specific yeah. well i wouldn't I, I probably would wouldn't use the word bad eggs i think it's, it's really the case i think there is i'll um i'll yeah. explain exactly the person that you're dealing with <laughs> so <laughs> okay <they're, laughs> no names please <laughs> so they've they've turned they've Unless turned up you. to training <laughs> They've, they've turned up to training. They constantly chat just before people about to start reps. Yeah. Um, they're slowing down before the line, constantly moaning, saying they're tired before uh, reps and talking people out of it. Um, and then turn up infrequently. Yeah, I think... Well, I suppose I've got... Two examples that like kind of touch on maybe things that are similar to that, and in both cases they've actually um, it's been a challenge, but they've gone on to be really really key parts of the group. Um, so the the first one um, was a young girl who had um, quite severe ADHD, and whilst I, it's the first time I've dealt with it at all, and in fairness, I didn't really know what I was dealing with much when it was first stuff, but I. I found it a real challenge and I think it's fair to say that the group found it quite a challenge uh, at times the way that she was behaving and in the end having sort of quite a long chat with her and her parents around that and it turned out you know her uh, diet side of things wasn't great in and I, I don't necessarily mean comes with you know fats carbohydrates I mean she was turning up hopped up on sugar um, which is like the most cursory research on ADHD suggests that's just a really bad thing to do so we kind of struck a deal that if she turned up having had sugar like that like sweets that afternoon um I wasn't going to coach her that was just it it's, like, it's not you're out of the group it's just I will not coach you when that's the case and then the other thing um the other challenge we had was as um as you were saying earlier Mark my group we do tend to have sort of quite long recoveries on things and that was um and 
as you would expect, a lot of, you know, kind of teenage kids, if they've got kind of, you know, five minutes rest, they'll have a laugh and a joke and a goof around. Um, now, most of them can just like flip the switch. Okay, it's time to run again. I think because of her ADHD, she found it really hard to kind of switch from one to the other. It's like once she was hopped up and wired and bouncing around and playing, she found it very difficult to get back into work mode. So we kind of agreed that, okay, if, if people were being like that, she just needed to remove herself from the situation. Yeah. And um, she, abs- if she didn't love athletics as much, it might have been, it might not have worked, but she loved and she bought into this fully. And she was absolutely brilliant. Um, and she came on leaps and bounds after that. Um, so I think she kind of, that's just a, one case it shows. It's, you know, d- don't give up on them because you've got to understand why, why these things are happening. There's another one that is when I started at Tunbridge. Um, I won't name him, but he'll, he'll know exactly what I'm, what I'm talking about him. And I'm sure he won't mind. Um, when I first started, he was kind of like the, the joker of the group. He was a bit of a clown. He was one of the most dedicated in terms of turning up, but half the time he was a, he was a real nightmare, in all honesty. <laughs> he was just goofing around all the time. Um, you probably know his name. You probably heard me shouting it from bellowing it from one side of the track to the other. I was like, get back to the line. Um, <laughs> but he has gone on and become a real sort of stalwart of a group. And I think the, the issue there was the fact that when he was sort of younger and going through the under 13s, he'd been involved quite a long time. He, there were some really naturally gifted ones in the group that were doing some really, really good things as under 13s. And basically just hadn't really had time for the training to sort of take effect. And, you know, he developed a little bit later than some of them as well. So I think he kind of saw his role as being the joker. Because it's like, that, well, they were the performers. I'm, I'm, I'm the clown, essentially. I'm the, I'm the one that keeps it fun. And it's just, just talking to him and getting him to realise that, no, no, you can progress. You can actually be quite good. And he's, he's gone on and he's, he's turned out a BAL meet. He's, he's, yeah. he's turned into a good little athlete. Um, yeah. But it just took a bit of time. Um, and I think making him sort of realise that, it, it doesn't have to act that way. That doesn't have to be his role. We had, we had a lad like that in the early days. Um, I mean, he used to finish last in every race. Well, not every race, but a lot of races cross country. And, and yet his, his mates were winning national championships at under 13, under 15. Um, and what I did, I gave him some responsibilities, especially on race day. Yeah. And he'd do the team chat. He, he, they were getting a huddle before the race. And they'd get him to do the team chat. And he'd always come up with something. And it would yeah. relax them or fire them up. And that was his bit to play. I made sure he had, and even at training, you know, could he do this? Could he do the speech to people? He could do all that, you know, quite happily. And make people laugh, but make the people listen. And um, try and use them in, that, in, those, uh, in those cases. I, I think it's important, though, to talk to them, um, Lewis. And, you know, just thinking about what you said. You know, delaying, delaying the start of reps and things like that. That that could just come down to worry about actually performing the task well, and it's their way of relieving the tension a little bit or taking the pressure off or whatever. And so, some dialogue to understand what lies behind it is important. And you've got the advantages. You know, it's a small group, so you can you can identify stuff like that really well. Um, you, you haven't quite then got the advantage of the peer pressures in, in, in numbers, but if it's having an effect on the group, then I think if you, if you talk them through it and explain it and then ask some questions about how they're feeling at training, do they look forward to it? Are they nervous about it? Are they struggling with some aspect? All those sorts of things. You might find that something comes out you know, because you've got a good relationship with all the group. And I don't even yeah, I'm not talking about mine in particular. I'm just you know, about... I, did, I was going to say, I didn't know if it was even a real instance, but I think... Oh, no. I, I, I would <laughs> say... Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I have see your group a lot, and you know, there's one or two in there. You know, <laughs> we rib them a bit, you know, as soon as... It, yeah, you can't do much about it. It's raining. It's raining. You can't, there's no point moaning and bringing everybody else down in the group about it. And But I think, bit by bit, you can make that... Um, a topic for discussion and make them aware that you know if you're going to come down here and moan it's cold and wet every time um, that's not going to do any good for the how the group's operating mm. and you know you can have a bit of a joke I want you to come down here and say all you've got to say even if you don't mean it is I'm really looking forward to training great to see you guys and yeah we, we used to have a <laughs> we used, we've, had, we've had games where we sit in the clubhouse 
and we know somebody's going to come up and say, how long will it be before this person mows? And we all have a little bet. Somebody goes, oh, it'll be five seconds, somebody 10 seconds. Uh, and then we all start, we all start laughing when he, when he has a moan. And uh, he goes, what's going on about? And you explain. And with a bit of humour, he becomes conscious of what he's doing. And uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, it's... Uh, Everyone knows about this now. I better yeah. stop doing that. People think of me as a, as a complainer. Well, yeah, sorry, you can't use that tactic. But you know what I mean? It's, um, yeah. I, think, I think if you're not careful... I mean, I can remember having a meeting at, here at our house. And it was a guy who was doing some research for university on the mental side of the sport. And one of the girls said, I've got this terrible habit. She said, if one of, the, one of my friends in the group starts moaning and groaning, oh, I've got a tight hamstring or my calf's a bit sore, I don't feel great today. She says, I empath, empathize with her immediately. I go into that, that sort of vibe with her and start saying, I've got something wrong with me, even if I haven't. <laughs> yeah, she's, everyone's bringing each other down. And it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a defense mechanism. You know, um, no, very few people come down, clap their hands, and say, "Right, this is going to be fantastic tonight. I'm looking forward to this." Do they? But it can have such an impact on group mentality. I think if you've got, yeah. if you you face those situations. Yeah, Lewis, I think that, that example you gave. I think it, those are obviously very um, directly negative things in terms of how a group a group session could run and the impact that person would have on it. But I think. It's worth saying as well, you do get those individuals that they're not necessarily doing doing anything negative. It's just for whatever reason, it just doesn't quite fit. Um, and I think there are times when it, you, you do have to sort of say, look, it's um, essentially it, it just doesn't quite work. Again, that Alan Bishop I mentioned earlier in, in that same podcast, he was talking about that, that point of people having different fits. He gave a really good analogy. He was actually talking about coaching jobs and like you know, kind of him working with head coaches that he liked and things. Um, but he gave a really good analogy of um, a pair of trousers. So you could have the most like kind of you know several thousand pounds Prada, I don't know Swarovski crystal encrusted trousers that you know handmade, hand tailored, and all, all this sort of stuff. But if they're a size thirty one waist and you're a size thirty eight, it they're not going to fit. It, do, it doesn't matter how it doesn't mean they're bad trousers they, they might be the best trousers in the world but they won't fit <laughs> and i think some sometimes you can have that with athletes and it could be you could have a, a a group that is a great group a coach that's a great coach an athlete but you know is a great athlete but that doesn't necessarily mean they're all going to fit together uh, got a question for you lewis because you, you you well you haven't transferred you're a coach and an athlete yeah how it, there, in context of the culture of the group and um, the dynamics, do you now operate differently and say things differently than you would have done? And what, what are they? I don't think I've changed at all. Right, really? I was, always, I was always the one when we were younger trying to say to people, oh, come on, join in on this. Oh, come on. And then... Uh, Going back, yeah, sim what Andy was saying, or well, what you were saying earlier about uh, when people say they feel bad, I seem to get like a, a buzz off that. So when someone's, when I can see someone's physically hurting from a session, I end up perking up more. <laughs> so it works. It's a sadist. That's all it is. <laughs> so, so if someone's like, oh, I'm feeling absolutely terrible makes me feel a little bit better about myself and I'm able to give a little bit more encouragement anyway. Oh, right. so very sadistic, but uh, yeah. works quite right. well. For me. Um, no, I mean, no, probably the same, maybe a slightly more diplomatic in how I say things, depending on who it is. Um, Cause effectively the group's only about seven or eight people. Uh, and I'll probably start trying to wean in a few sort of younger multi-eventers who are, well, not young, like 16, 17. Um, so I'll have to change my approach slightly talking to them because, well, they, won't, they wouldn't have had the same uh, amount of abuse as the others in the group. <laughs> so they wouldn't be quite used to it yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, slightly more diplomatic, but I wouldn't say I've changed too much. So do you, did you and do you still then arrive at training um, 
naturally feeling really positive all the time or do you have to psych yourself up into that state of mind sometimes well sometimes yeah sometimes i have to actively think oh yeah come on let's get into this one depends what kind of session it is as well most of the time i'm absolutely fine i'm just really you've looking forward to getting down you've set the sessions i've set the sessions yeah so i know what they're going to be and i've set them far enough in advance so i don't change them because i know at that point in time that's what i thought was right okay so you um you stick with that yeah yeah so i stick to the guns regardless yeah um there's been one or two times where we've done like me i think it's myself alex and myself alex ian oh that, it was the whole group harry and richard all doing we did three by one k so we had a multi, uh, multi event about six weeks time which is trying to get a bit of endurance in and me and alex sat down it was they were pouring down with rain we just went oh come on let's let's change the last rep so we can keep the speed up a little bit and then ian just went off on one saying no how are you doing that making the session easier and like moaning about it loads <laughs> and we were like oh god we'll just do it then so we just we just did it kept it the same he ended up running about 20 seconds slower <laughs> and we both ran a lot better and we're like, oh yeah cheers lady and it'll make us do the last rep because we're just about to change it <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah so generally try to stick to things unless i'm outvoted really or if someone's got a very strong opinion about something it's quite I, when i very first started i found it quite difficult not to be not not to be running the reps knowing it's myself and someone else so if i was doing let's say five five hundreds i'd get four in and go oh, i'm not really not feeling good but then obviously when you're when i was being coached it was that dave set five i've got to do five because i'm being accountable basically i'm saying i'm saying i'm doing that because he's told me i'm doing that and i've told him i am definitely going to do that when i was thinking the stuff stuff myself Mm. have the option to make things easier yeah so i had to kind of battle with myself not to do that and i ended up getting out of that pretty quickly once i got fit again after injury but um it's now quite nice having people like alex in the group where you know everyone that well anyone in the group everyone knows the session everyone's expecting to do that well, that was my other point, because um, I think all three of us plan in France, we publish in advance what we're doing. And I've personally, I've always felt that's that's the right thing to do, because then you can have dialogue with the athletes about what's expected. They will ask you questions if they wish to about the session, what you're trying to achieve, what they're trying to aim at, how it fits in. Oh, they will remind that you that they've got something coming up or they perhaps they don't feel capable because they're unwell or, you know, all these all this dialogue goes on as a result of it. But there are some really good distance running coaches that will not tell, will refuse to tell their group until almost they're on the start line for the first rep. And yeah. I've never un understood that myself, but again, going back to what answers, we're all different. We all work in different ways and what works for some doesn't work for others. Um, but they're, they're, um, one of the reasons they said is if you, if you publish it all in advance, athletes will spend their life just worrying about what's coming up so if you don't publish it they don't they take all that energy and waste of energy away and they can so i don't know i i, I just couldn't do it to people I, and i think you would lose i'd lose some respect by it not being a two-way street so much yeah. it gives them a chance to have some dialogue um whereas it's basically you're on the line you're going to do what i say get on with it otherwise and i'd find that very difficult personally our, our group used to do that so when dave was coaching he'd tell us on the day but we've got quite a few we had quite a few characters in the group where if they knew beforehand potentially some people might not have even turned up and others would have like you said worried about it not eaten before the session things like that mm -hmm. so when i started coaching um i said i've written up a plan do you guys want it and everyone said yes or uh, one and then everyone else has bullied that person into knowing the session as well. So now I just said, put everyone on the email saying, these are the sessions for the next 12 weeks. These are my thoughts behind them. This is how I've planned it. Yeah. Then if any, anyone wants to input and say, oh, how come you've done this? Then they can tell me. It's normally only, normally Alex that questions it and asks for my reasoning of things. Yeah. 
but it's there if anyone wants to see how I've planned it effectively. But um, then you can choose to ignore it or not. Yeah. yeah. I think I've probably added extra bits on the end of sessions and things that I've maybe not told them about. So I might, I might chuck a few extra bits in, but the, the, the core sort of meat of a session, I think, yeah, that, that I've always let them know that. I, um, I, I can see the logic behind what well, you were saying that those, um, those other coaches, you mentioned Mark, that, that don't let people know. I can see the logic about not having people kind of spend their time worrying about it. Um, I suppose there is some sort of slight advantage to that. But then, I don't know, I, th- I think that the, if, you, if you're wanting to get the athletes to properly buy into the programme and understand you know, the direction it's taking them in, I think they, they, need to, they need to see that as a whole. I suppose they don't even necessarily need to you know, really study it or look at it, but I think they kind of, to, to know that there is, uh, it's structured and not just something that's been made up off the hoof, I think that's... Yeah quite valuable i mean i know back when i was at university um my coach was, loved him to bits he was, he was a great coach still really good friends now um but he he wouldn't send he wouldn't send the sessions um i think partly because i think as some of them we kind of ended up sort of recycling the same session so you could kind of guess what it was going to be anyway but um, i think there were also those, so those surprises sprung every now and then of particularly nasty things um and, and maybe there was that idea of you know not having people worrying and, and making sure that people turn up for them. Mm-hmm. Um, but I know that I personally found that really frustrating. Um, so I don't know. I, I think kind of what you, I think you lose more than you gain by doing that. So. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Good. Mm. Fab. Well, should we, does, should we wrap it up? I think that's uh, yeah, oh, a, I'll, I'll say one more thing. It does, it does yeah, massively depend on who you're dealing with. Yeah. Like, if you're in, and going back to what you were saying earlier, I've got a few. Little, I wrote them down, so I won't forget. Um, but when you started your group, if you had to change your values slightly, otherwise you probably wouldn't have had a group at all. Yeah. Because there's not many people that would see, let's say, the sessions you're planning, and go right. I'm going to put myself through that. I'm going to be that strict. Not that scary, are they? <laughs> no, but they're just saying if that, if it's a real structured yeah. thing, they go. Ooh. Yeah. I think for, yeah, I think for my group, I think it was quite a culture shock. Yeah, yeah. So it's good to just obviously merge in as you go, and obviously, like 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 we said before, some people wouldn't turn up to training, yeah, if they haven't fully bought in and they've already seen the session. Yeah. So, yeah, um, yeah it's quite. Uh, there's a lot of things to play around with. You can choose which bits to listen to, which bits to actually do. But I'm quite. I say I'm almost selfish with some of the things I do because I don't necessarily listen to everyone's problems all the time. The sessions are out there. I've set the sessions for their benefits. Anything else around that, that almost, I almost don't have time to, to worry about. So if someone's not really getting into training at that moment in time, I'm probably a bit too selfish thinking, all oh, right, let's try to get them uh, a bit more motivation get back into it i spend a little bit of time on it and then leave it there but yeah you two probably have a lot more well not not more time but you have a much more focused approach on getting buy-in from people and making sure they understand what you're doing i think you can certainly um i certainly do spend a fair bit of time and effort on that but then there is like i say that there are those i mean i can think of a a couple of the years that like like i mentioned earlier it's just not the right fit and it's you can spend a huge amount of time sort of an effort chasing that one person trying to get that one person to buy in and you're detracting from the rest of the group um i suppose it's you know it's like mark back in your, your sales days it's like if you if you were just chasing one customer that were trying to get them to buy that one thing and they weren't doing it and you spend months and months and months how many other people have passed by <laughs> um and that means that you... one, thing, one thing we haven't spoken about you know the size of the group you know i just can't imagine for the life of me having a, a group of like one or two people or just that's it i mean there are coaches that just pretty much have one athlete and the it's a pressure cooker environment especially if they're quite mm. highly strung and you're in, fully invested in one person i don't trust anybody you know to 
have a good relationship for it. I mean, so it always amazes me that people are able to do it. You know, um, I mean, Laura, Laura Waitman and uh, Steve Cram, for example, you know, Steve Cram's dabbled in coaching other people, but not in a big way. Um, he's fully invested, but he, each way, um, that takes some, that takes some different, a different way of going about it. And it must be incredibly um, stressful sometimes, but huge amount of trust in each other. You know, as we, we, yeah. we, we can, we can pick and choose a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I've, um, no I'm, that's it. I'm, I'm not, not really thought about that before. So the only thing I've done that's been remotely similar is like with some rugby players and footballers players and stuff. I've done a bit of sort of right. speed consultancy type things, but um, I think with them, it's very different. Like, it's just a little bit here and there on the fringes of what their, their main yeah. training is. Um, so yeah, you're right. I think it would be a real challenge just <laughs> to just work with one person. You probably haven't seen it. You might not even have heard of her as a, as a female um, marathon runner, half marathon, marathon road racer, Hayley Carruthers, who's from the Midlands. And she's got a coach who runs alongside her a lot of the time as well. And um, Dan Robinson and uh, you know, they've worked together and she's, she's come from nowhere to a really good standard. But they did a little documentary. You can, you can see it. Uh, I think it was from was it last summer or the summer before, but it's qu quite raw. You know, yeah, she gets really upset with some of her performances, and you can see Dan sitting there thinking, "I'm being filmed here," um, and he, he he doesn't know what to say, and you can't say anything when an athlete is that f upset and fed up. You just cannot say anything, even though you think. Oh, the viewer's going to think oh, I've got some nugget of brilliance that I'm going to come up with to make her feel better. There yeah. is nothing you can say when an athlete is that fed up, and you just have to pick your moments a day or two or a week later to to pick it up again. And that that's fine. But if you had like four or five race, bad races on the row, row that gets extremely draining. I should imagine and, uh, yeah. and requires a different. It's a, it's a totally different culture than what we're, we're talking about when we're talking about a culture, you know. Mm. I suppose as well, one of the advantages that we have is assuming we do our jobs well, people generally improve. That's not, that's not to say that every single person is improving all the time. But say you've got one person that is, is in that, say, you know, I, I run a bad form and things aren't going well. Yeah. If the rest of the group is generally you know, improving and performing well and all those sort of things. Now, whilst I recognise that might cause some tensions between one person feeling a bit crappy and the other people feeling good, yeah. I think they can probably look at the group as a whole and say, well, you know, this programme and this coaching, it, it works. Something's not quite right at the moment, but generally it works. Yeah. If you're essentially in a, a, a one athlete, one coach situation, it, it must be very easy for the athlete to just turn around and say, well, what you're you're not sending me the right stuff yeah. it's on you it's yeah, um i think you know if, if you're if you're in a really bad place and you're, you're looking for looking for a, a problem it's yeah the, the kind of the rebuttal that a coach would usually have or well, not 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 they necessarily have that discussion but the kind of a thing that would stop a stop an athlete maybe questioning the program isn't really there no. yeah uh, very interesting yeah good, yeah. good uh, stuff and 20 minutes, I think. Yeah. Right. Well, let's wrap things up. Um, really enjoyed that, gents. Uh, it's really interesting to get your, your insights from sort of looking at, like I said, I think we will we'll come from slightly different um, angles and slightly different perspectives. Um, but no, it's been, been really good to share that. So, so thanks very much. Um, for anybody listening, if you want to get in touch with us, we are on various social media bits. Um, there's a Facebook page. Um, just uh, plug in our Track Coach Clubhouse. Uh, should pop up uh, similarly on Instagram the same and we have an email address that's just uh, track coach clubhouse or one word at outlook.com okay cheerio everyone I'm going to pause the recording <laughs>